Hi, Hi Catalina. How are you? Okay. I think the drive link is not working, right? You think what? Oh, no. What's that? The Google Drive. Is the Google Drive link working? For yeah, you? I'm checking it right so. now. I'm just checking. Uh, I no, it's asking me to sign in. Okay. Let me open, change the access. Hello, Dr. Moses. Welcome. Hi, Brett. How are you? Can you Hello, can you hear the me? Unmute, uh, now we can hear you, um, yes. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm using a new headset, so I'm just... Okay, well that could be tricky. We find here in Clubhouse that um, things like speaker phones or just very basic earbuds work better than noise canceling headsets or anything that's kind of fancy. Oh, so, well the good yeah. news is these aren't very fancy. They're just simple earbuds. Oh, perfect. Okay. But how does it sound? Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, AirPods can be problematic. Earbuds are great. Earbuds are never a problem. So, good. Awesome. Yay. Yeah, good. How's your day? It's good. It's good. Um, just, you know, trying to get some stuff through the usual, but excited to uh, be able to talk here. So thanks again uh, for having me. It's such an honor. It's wonderful to have you here. And I have a friend I've met in Clubhouse, and she had shared with me several months ago that her father... Um, you know, he's unable to speak or move. And, and so I was particularly interested in hearing what you had to say. Because what a life changing um, bit of work you're doing. Oh, well, we hope so. That's the goal, right? Um, probably a long way to go. But yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. about your friend's father. I mean, it's, it is a really difficult extremely extremely difficult condition but hopefully hopefully we can you know we all feel that there's a little bit of hope um, for the future for this so and you know we're just one approach right there's also i think a lot of other people are looking into more like biological i guess like stem cell or something solution so maybe from a multi-pronged uh, tactic, then one of these approaches will be able to deliver. I think that ours, yeah, I'm optimistic about ours, so that's good. That's better than good. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, like how much people need need this need this help, need this um, you know problem to be ameliorated, and to hear that there's hope and more than one approach. That's fantastic. Glad you think so, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I was just going to ask because I don't really use, um, I never really participated in a clubhouse meeting before or uh, gathering. But um, so it seems like you posted a PDF, so people will follow along with with the PDF. I think this is what. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. So okay, people right. can, can view it, it's view only, so people can view it. And so um, people have to scroll through it um, on their own. So it's really helpful to in between mention when you switch slides, um, like later on uh, to maybe mention in between on which the slide number. Um, so uh, yeah, but but usually it works out pretty well. So great, and thank you for sending those amazing slides. 
So. Oh cool. yeah. Thank no you. worries. No worries. My pleasure. Um, hopefully we'll. Yeah, some of the stuff is still. You know, it's. We've talked about it before, um, in a conference, but it's, uh, it's unpublished. But hopefully soon, we'll have another publication out to cover, to kind of show even more where we're going from here. So, um, yeah, but again, it's, it really is quite the, quite the honor to talk here. Um, appreciate the, the interest, always happy to try and spread the word and, and all that. I know that when this kind of paper first came out, there was always I was kind of worried that there'd be more of it, but there was always some discussion of like, oh, this is going to be mind reading and they're going to use it to, you know, the government's going to use it to monitor our thoughts and things like that. Um, just really crazy stuff. But so it seems like being able to talk to an audience that is probably not coming in with these, uh, with these, uh, what's the right word? with this framing or with these assumptions, it's going to be pretty nice, I think. So yeah, I will. And I assume people will be able to interrupt if they have questions at any point, right? Well, that's up to you. We okay, can, yeah. yeah, we can have a Q&A following your discussion, or you can have your discussion and that, that way, I don't want to say the same thing twice. Yeah, yeah. Or you Got can it. have, yeah, intermittent, you can, we can have, if people have questions, they can ask intermittently and, and drive the conversation. That's, entirely up to you but um it's interesting that you mentioned the conspiracy theory sort of things i i wouldn't have thought of that but right now in clubhouse there's a room going on um in the hallway i just saw and i think it's something about um it's called like finally proof that the microchips here we go proof of microchips finally <laughs> so that room's happening right now <laughs> just by the way well I'm thankful to everyone who ends up in this room and not mm -hmm. that room, I guess. Yeah, and here's Serena. Although... Hello. She won't. She's not a conspiracy theorist, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I engage in actual conspiracies. <laughs> oh, there you Just go. <laughs> well, at least it's not a theorist, right? <laughs> well, I tend to be more of a theorist, but not a conspiracy theorist. That's funny. Um, Serena, did you hear what David had said? No, I Maybe came in completely on cold context and dropped that one. Okay, do you <laughs> mind repeating? Oh, That's shocking. Oh yeah, no, it's just. Um, well, I can even actually say even more about that. I had a really funny experience a while ago during my PhD, where it was kind of our first demonstration that we had gotten a system for like uh, real time decoding of speech and this was just perceived speech. So in this, it was a very basic experiment where someone with epilepsy who was volunteering in our speech studies, which is how a lot of our historical data, we would get it with this type of recording approach that we have. But basically someone would just listen to one of 10 sentences and we would scan the brain activity and we would be able to in real time identify what sentence they were hearing. And it was a very controlled experiment, you know, very limited application. Um, it was just kind of a proof of concept. And, you know, I was excited, you know, I think it was um, a good paper and all that, but it wasn't expecting any kind of press or anything. And then one day we got, I got a lot of notifications that all of a sudden that some tabloid, I think in the UK had somehow vastly misinterpreted the results from this and were claiming that we had a mind reading machine like literally and then it got to the point oh, where no. even local news outlets were reaching out to us and being like can you describe your mind reading machine to us like what's going on and it was it was absolutely crazy and it's like people didn't even read past the abstract and they misread the abstract and then didn't read anything else and uh so the tabloid didn't reach out to you or anything like that like before they tried to publish because uh, that sounds so uh, so like a British tabloid. <laughs> it uh, they actually did not know, and I think one of them even like somehow quoted me on something. I don't 
I don't know how they did. Maybe they took a quote from the paper, but they like wildly, um, you know, took it out of context and things like that. So it made it seem like we had a quote. And then the next tabloid in the chain was like, you know, David was quoted from saying this according to tabloid one. And it was just, uh, it was a huge mess. I could see, I, I could see the sensational angle on blowing that right to the, right to where they did. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It was, it's a little disappointing, but, um, I guess when your only goal is to get clicks, then that's the kind of stuff that is a viable strategy. I, I don't know, but it was just funny. Cause it's like that paper was so far from what they were saying. Now the current paper, the original comment I had was that we did have some, um, some discussion of like, you know, people take this to the, to the kind of cynical view and like the sci-fi, like, black mirror style view of like, Oh, now we're going to read people's thoughts and no one's internal things are safe. It's going to be used for government interrogation and things like that. So that's always something that we try to, uh, you know, we're very careful about when we talk because we don't think it's that. <laughs> and it's important to, you know, get the messaging right. But I was just saying, I'm sure most people who will be listening here, uh, won't succumb to that type of um, misconception. We, we, we certainly, yeah, we certainly try to clean that stuff up. <laughs> we do what we can. That's good. We're on guard for you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So this is actually one of the reasons why I started doing this also on Clubhouse and on social media. And we kind of then as a team came together um, to do this because I had um, also situations on um, here that, you know, I was attacked, like we are all paid actors and we want to like, <laughs> do whatever to people. And, you know, we are monsters like scientists, especially during, you know, shutdown times, people were kind of isolated and freaking out and then letting things, you know, play out in their mind this way. So it's really important to me to, as a huge motivation to, um, that people get to know and get to interact personally with researchers, with scientists. And, you know, it's one thing to have this in a podcast or video form on YouTube. It's another thing if you actually get the chance to personally interact and ask questions, I know we don't have a video, but the voice is still very, quite powerful. And this, this, this personal interaction is quite powerful. And I heard from various people uh, over time that said to me that they were thinking these things and these things before, but since they had the chance here um, to personally interact with scientists that they have a whole different view, actually a view that makes them like hopeful that there are people out there working on these problems. And so, so it, I know we're just doing a little bit. We are not a humongous, you know, club or platform, although we are growing quite well, but you know, it's like <laughs> the little thing we can do as a group. And not just, you know, saying, oh, the situation is bad, but to actively do something about that. So I appreciate you mentioning that. And um, that's, you know, one reason, of course, one reason to record these rooms is that people around the world, let's um, say our members in Europe, that it's just in the middle of the night, that they can listen to this later and keep this. But also another reason is, that it's harder to take things out of context if you have the whole recording of the whole session available. Like, um, then it's harder. If you don't record and people just, you know, record on their phones like tiny snippets um, of the conversation and it's way easier to make like a, a twisted story out of it. So we, we try our best to, you know, to avoid those situations here so I'm glad you you're here 
and sharing it with us and supporting this cause basically so thank you yeah it's my pleasure that sounds um yeah that sounds really really good it's it is nice to be able to interact also with you know from my end to interact with the people who i'm talking to so it's it's good to get questions and to have that kind of conversation because it you know it can inform the way that we want to you know keep on with the research and how we think about which questions are the most important and what is the most effective way to communicate these our findings and to frame our findings so yeah it's my pleasure for sure okay and with that said we had the uh, wonderful pre-conversation but i think we can uh, slowly start um and um yeah so welcome everyone to science society today um we are very honored to have our guest speaker here dr david moses and he will talk about his um published research and and also give us some very um, brand new updates on his research, which is a great honor. And um, let me um, introduce him to you a little bit. Um, Dr. Moses mm -hmm. focuses on novel methods for decoding speech from the brain activity of clinical trial participants <clears throat> who are unable to speak on their own. He manages and coordinates projects for the lab of um, Edward uh, Chang um, that are part of the Bravo clinical trial, which has a long-term goal of de developing speech neuroprosthesis to restore communications to patients with severe paralysis. Um, he also uh, maintains the software architecture um, to enable real-time translation of brain activity into speech, uh, which he originally developed while he was pursuing his PhD. In, uh, so he published recently the proof of concept study um, in 2021 and his colleagues and demonstrated that uh, brain activity recorded from participants with paralysis can be trans uh, could be um, uh, directly translated into words that the participants were attempting to say in real time and um, yeah that's basically um, the the work we, uh, Dr. David Moses will share with us today, but uh, for a little bit more personal career um, um, questions, usually Victoria asks a few questions in the beginning. I hope that's okay, David, and then it's time for your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the intro. Um, any other questions I'm happy to answer? All right, thank you so much. You've opened the door. So um, as Katarina said, and thank you Katarina, Science Society is so grateful and happy to welcome you here tonight. And to carry us into your discussion, um, my question is of a more personal nature so that we can get to know you a little bit before we um, move forward into your work. And so what I'm asking is if you can think of a time in your life when you did notice that you felt an affinity for science and that can be maybe um, somebody said something or a relative it can maybe when in your childhood or a class but something that let you know that that you know you had sparked an interest in science that's hmm, that is a good question i think i've always kind of been i mean when I was young and in elementary school and things like that, just I always enjoyed kind of math class and science class and things of that nature. Um, pro probably a big step for me was in high school, I was taking a computer science class. And I remember actually, I, I really didn't like it for a long period of time where I was, I just couldn't really see the big picture, I think. And then finally one day, um, 
feel like it was we were learning about objects <laughs> like object oriented program in class or programming in class and i find it finally clicked and then that kind of was a big moment where i was like wait this is like i kind of see why this is really cool and you know i joined the computer science team <laughs> which was actually quite fun and then yeah just continuing on that was a big moment and then maybe also another moment was an undergrad and some research opportunities i had to kind of understand a little bit more about neuroscience and that stimulated my interest kind of in and wanting to do something related to neuroscience and then being able to combine both of those things you know programming and um and like neural engineering neuroscience type focus uh, in grad school, it was kind of, yeah, it's was, it was a really great opportunity overall, many of those stages. Thank you. It seems like it was, it was quite a natural progression for you. That's how it felt. Yeah. Hmm. And, and so then can you, can you progress us now to take us along the path to the work that you're doing today? Yeah. Even that also, when I look back, it, it feels like a very natural progression, um, partly because I, I'm still in the same lab that I got my PhD in. So I, I joined the lab in 2013 to start working on this. And among my first projects, we were just trying to decode. Um, we were trying to take brain activity of, you know, able speakers, but while they were just listening to, to speech and then being able to try and trying to decode that into text, like the brain activity into text of what they were hearing. And that was just kind of because listening to speech is much more controlled. There's less variability. You can play the exact same sentence, for example, a hundred times to someone. And so that's a lot more controlled as opposed to when someone tries to say it a hundred times, a slight variabilities. And also um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of info a lot of understanding of the speech perception circuit in, in humans and stuff. So basically it was, that's where I started. It was trying to decode heard speech. And then the next project was the real time one I described where we were trying to do that, a simple version of that in real time. And then the next project was trying to do that, but also with produced speech. And then the, and then the thought was, well, you can show all this, and it works, you know, fairly well, but can it work when it, you know, when it really matters in someone who actually can't speak? And then that's when this clinical trial started. And that's why I was like, I have to stay in the lab. I feel like my whole PhD was kind of leading towards this type of being able to address this question. So I decided to stay on and then, you know, that's what leads into the work I'll talk about today. So I, I do feel like it was pretty, I'm pretty fortunate for all the how natural that progression was. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. We can see how one thing led you into another and developed your expertise as well. So um, that's, that's a beautiful story. And at this point, you're welcome to move into your presentation. And then we understand that you're happy to have questions along the way. And um, maybe we just ask that people on stage will mic flash and then we can make sure that everyone's voice is heard and um yeah i think i think that's it and we will take care of everything for you so you can please enjoy your talk and the mic is yours okay great yeah thank you and thanks everyone who's um joining today as um as was just said we I'm totally happy to be interrupted at any point for any questions. Um, just something that you think maybe it'd be uh, interesting to talk about a little bit more Then we can do that during the talk or at the end. So yeah, um, I'll just get right into it. So I will try to I guess indicate when I'm changing slides in the slide deck for those who are following along, but, um, Bear with me because I may forget a few transitions, but just to give an overview on slide two about what we're talking about today, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, first, I want to motivate, you know, kind of, well, first of all, explain what a speech neuroprosthesis is and why 
such a thing might be helpful and important. And then I'm going to talk about the initial work that we have uh, published last year that was demonstrating kind of a, a proof of concept of this. And then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about, a, you know, slightly lower level details about how we can improve uh, the features that we use for modeling um, and to improve decoding performance and to talk about different methods of controlling the device for um, participants to have access to, for the patients to have access to. Okay, so on slide four, I just wanted to briefly bring up this condition that some of you might be familiar with, um, this condition called locked-in syndrome or LIS, which it can be caused by a few conditions. Um, what happens is that if you're locked in, you will be awake and conscious, but you know, basically unable to move or speak. And so this, as you might imagine, is extremely debilitating for a variety of reasons. And one that turns out to be you know, extremely detrimental to quality of life is the inability to communicate with ease to friends, to caregivers, to family, um, just that kind of disconnect from your surroundings in addition to, of course, not being able to move can be, um, yeah, extremely devastating. Um, there is some technology. So on slide five, I talked a little bit about some existing technology to restore communication. Um, a lot of these are based, use eye tracking technology. So in this image, you can see there's a screen and there's a camera that's monitoring the eye gaze of this person who was paralyzed and it can help them, it can enable them to type out something and to control their personal device. So this is of course quite slow. And if the patient has ocular motor dysfunction, which means they can't uh, fully control their eye gaze, then this can be um, ineffective. And so this is where brain computer interfaces can offer a different solution. Um, the goal here is to interpret the intended messages and to translate brain activity into the intended messages of the patient. And so this, obviously, if it works completely, means that you don't need residual motor control. It doesn't, you don't need to move your eyes or do anything. The ideal device would just allow full control uh, very natural and autonomous control by the patient. So right now, a lot of methods exist that require letter-by-letter -letter spelling of the intended messages, such as in this example shown, this is a paper from 2016 that showed a um, paralyzed person who was able to use this brain-computer interface to type out messages. But these are quite slow, something on the order of, I think, uh, slower than like two words per minute. So you know, it still can be very beneficial for the user, but we think in the lab, as I'll talk about on, on slide seven, that there's a lot of motivation for a direct speech BCI. And what I mean by this is something that um, has the user attempt to speak or, uh, yeah, so basically the user is naturally trying to speak and speech is normally a very efficient mode of communication um, as you, can probably tell by the fact that we're using that right now for this talk instead of some other mode of communication. And then as they're attempting to speak, is it possible to have a BCI, a brain computer interface, translate the brain activity um, recorded from the user directly into what they're trying to say? And so, you know, is there one question you might have is like, well, what's the basis? You know, what's the foundation for this type of um, theory that this might be possible. And so there's been a lot in the past decade, a lot of research into the mechanisms of speech production. And this involves also like articulator control, but furthermore, neuroscience as well. So how does the brain and what parts of the brain coordinate all of the muscles in the vocal tract that give rise to speech? And so on slide eight, I'm showing a, a few images here. In the bottom left, I'm just showing which areas are highly associated with speech production or heavily implicated. And so it's these blue regions and this green region. 
Um, and then on the right graphic, basically this was a study from our group from some colleagues of mine in 2013 that showed that you could kind of see different parts of this brain area called the ventral sensory motor cortex um, that is heavily implicated in speech production. And you could see like, like different, very small portions of this brain area reliably though, um, were differentially, differentially activated during different uh, speech production sounds. So when someone is saying ba, you see certain electrodes report that they um, you know, are recording a lot of activity. And when someone's saying ga, you see uh, different activations. And these patterns um, can eventually, if you go to the next slide, it, when you scale up and in further studies, we've seen that you can actually detect these patterns with such precision that you can not, you know, synthesize speech directly from brain activity. So that's one study on the top and then also decode into text and that's the study on the bottom. So just very briefly about these two. In the top study, um, we had speakers. These are some work from colleagues of mine in the lab as well. Uh, these are able speakers and they're saying a sentence, for example, and offline the neural activity recorded while they said that sentence was decoded into a speech waveform to actually synthesize their voice. And this actually worked, you know, it's not perfect, but it worked fairly well. Um, and then in the bottom study was something very similar, except it was on the text level. So it was taking brain activity and translating that into text that the person was saying from um, a, a restricted vocabulary. It was, I can't remember exactly how many words, but um, it was probably around a thousand words, I think, but with pretty high accuracy. So the takeaway here is that for people who are able to speak, it is possible to decode what they are saying from brain activity. But of course, the next question is, okay, but would this work in people who are unable to speak? Um, so if someone who is locked in tried to speak, would you still see these uh, representations? Could you still decode speech in this way? because that is what's necessary to prove for the feasibility of a speech neuroprosthesis. Okay, and so that's kind of the end of the, the motivation for a speech neuroprosthesis um, section. So if there aren't any questions, I'm going to go to slide 13 to introduce um, the clinical trial that we started here at UCSF and the goal, so this stands for, B, it's the Bravo clinical trial, stands for BCI restoration of arm and voice. And Dr. Ganguly, who is a collaborator at UCSF, is his lab is focusing on kind of motor restoration. Um, so for example, controlling a robotic arm or cursor, um, basically to restore mobility. Um, our, our lab is focused on speech decoding. So we want to understand patients who are unable to speak, what does their brain activity look like when they're trying to speak? And can you actually develop technology that could translate these signals into the intended speech um, in kind of a long-term, you know, clinically viable application? And then on slide 14, we introduce our first clinical trial participant, Bravo One, who suffered from a brainstem stroke and as a result has severe limb and vocal tract paralysis. Um, he can still move very, very slightly. So he's not locked in, but um, his, when he tries to speak, it's unintelligible and he's unable to you know, control a mouse or keyboard. So he uses other means to, to communicate, but he is fully cognitively intact. And so on slide 15, we show that, we show the actual hardware that the, the neural implant device that we um, are using in this study. And so it's a, an array, it's like a sheet of 128 electrodes. So these are electrical sensors that were surgically implanted on the surface of his brain. And so these are getting, these are recording brain activity, you know, directly from the cortex, from the surface. So it has higher signal to noise ratios than, uh, you, you get more reliable signals than if you were to use EEG or something like that from outside the skull. And so basically the electrical signals from these sensors 
are passed through a digital connector that um, kind of is fed through a skull and the nut connector is what um, sends the signals to our computer for processing. And on the right, we're showing kind of the location of the electrodes. And uh, in the blue and the red electrodes are in this kind of uh, sensory motor cortex area where it's typically implicated in speech. So we just wanted to cover the brain areas that we think had a high likelihood for um, granting us access to speech signals. Okay, and then slide 16, I'm just showing some evoked responses during attempted speech. So just to kind of break down what's happening here, there's three different word targets. So he's attempting to say the word coming, hello, and family. So in those three words are indicated by these three separate colors. And this is showing a neural feature called high gamma activity, which um, I'm happy to go into more details later, but it's just a, a measure of neural response that we find very useful. And so you can see that where that vertical dashed line is, many electrodes are showing us a lot of activity, a lot of brain activity that seems to be directly correlated with the attempted speech. And furthermore, you see some differences here that depend on the word target. So this is all very promising. Uh, this was a promising first result for us because it's showing that even though his speech, like we can't understand what he's saying, when he tries to say these words, it's still differentiable in the neural activity. Um, and then slides 17 and 18, I may actually skip, excuse me, slide 17, because it's very similar to 18, but just to briefly talk about the models that we were using. So what we do in slide 18 is to take these high gamma measures, so a four second time window around when he tries to say each word, and we're training a deep learning model. So these are deep uh, artificial neural networks um, to, with the goal of translating this four seconds of neural activity into word probabilities. So in the current task that he has, um, he's trying to say 50 different words, you know, one at a time, of course, but the model is then trying to predict, okay, how likely is it that he was saying hello? How likely is it that he was saying computer? Um, how likely is that he was saying each of the 50 words from the brain activity? And this is when we train this model and when we evaluate it on slide 19, this is when we get this confusion matrix. And what it's showing here is that what you want to see is a strong, um, a prominent diagonal, which we do see in this, in this uh, figure. And that is saying that when he is trying to say the word am, where the model is predicting the word am. When he's trying to say the word are, it's often predicting the word are and so forth. And so we got an average classification accuracy of about 50%, um, which is, you know, we found to be very favorable given that chance is about 2%. So this, it was very clear to us that there's something here and that, um, you know, the type of approach that we're trying is actually feasible. Okay, in the next slide, I'm just giving an overview of kind of our proof of concept um, demonstration that we wanted to show. And so if you'll, if we'll go from, you know, letters A all the way through, th through G, we start with letter A and that's highlighting that he receives a prompt. So this is a screen and he reads a prompt such as, how are you today? Meanwhile, his brain activity is being recorded and streamed to a real time processing system. And that's, and there's multiple steps here that, that then occur to, uh, to process these signals. The first is just that there's some pre-processing to clean up the signals and to extract these kind of high gamma, these features that we think are, are more curated features basically of the underlying brain activity. And then those get passed to a speech detection model. And what's happening there is that we have this model that's just scanning the neural time points um, sample by sample to detect when he's trying to speak. So we can actually, you know, of course we wanna be able to determine what he says, but we also, need to be uh, we also need to determine when he's trying to speak. And so whenever we identify that he's trying to say something, then that gets passed as a classifier I was just describing. And then those word probabilities are passed through a language model that then says, okay, a sentence like I am very glasses is not as likely as I am very good. So it's, it's almost like an autocorrect feature 
um, in you know Siri or Alexa or these things that that uh, it's a it's a type of approach that is used in these technologies to help make sure that the sentences that are interpreted um, are grammatically reasonable. And so we found out that that's quite helpful. And the response in the end is decoded and displayed back on the screen. Okay, so that's kind of the setup. And then if we go to the next slide, we can actually see some example decoded sentences. So what I'm showing here is on the left is the target sentence. And there's seven different trials here. So seven uh, rows of this. And then in the middle is what you could get without using a language model. So you see some sentences that don't make a ton of sense, but uh, you can still see that a lot of the words are still successfully predicted solely from the neural activity. And then when you add in a language model, you get some definitely some cleaning up of the sentences to make them more reasonable. And on the next slide, this is just summarizing the results in a more quantitative way across all of the data. And so we are, we're seeing that chance performance is about 90%. So it's just kind of what would get output with random inputs. And then you can see without the language model, you had a 60% word error rate. And with a language model, it's about 25% word error rate on average. And what this means is, um, you can think of it as how often it makes mistakes. So at a 25% word error rate, that means roughly three out of every four of the words that were decoded were um, accurate for what he was actually trying to say. And on the right, we're just showing that on average, it's about 15 words per minute. So the speed is, is definitely an improvement compared to some of the previous technologies that, um, that have been shown. Okay, in the next slide, I'm just showing here where we found some, we used an analysis to find which electrodes were most useful to the models. And so we observed that for detection, you know, there's kind of this region in what's called the dorsal presential gyrus. Um, and these electrodes are really, what's happening to these electrodes, they're often respond to any speech signal. So that they're not really that great at telling apart which word was said, but they're really responsive to any word. And then in this, on the right, you see the classification results. And so electrodes from this region in the bottom right portion of the grid um, are really reliably kind of useful. They're very reliable for discriminating between which word was said. And so basically having access to this large spatial coverage of the grid was very helpful for us so that we can, um, so that we can record from both of these brain areas. Okay, and in the last slide of this section, slide 24, I'm just trying to show here that this isn't something that just happened in a week or a month or something. This was over a fairly long uh, time scale, about a, a year and a half, roughly, um, close to, yeah, 81 weeks. And so what I'm showing on the left is that this is just kind of showing where uh, when he is trying to say this word goodbye for one electrode, what does the brain activity look like for this channel? And so basically darker means there's a higher response. And so all I'm trying to show with this is that, yeah, over this long recording period, you see reliably, um, you can reliably identify signals from this electrode. And then on the right, it's a little more complicated of an analysis where basically we took out um, data at the very end of the study. So in the last few weeks of the study, and we said, okay, if you just train on uh, data that was recorded, you know, in a uh, very recently, how good do you do? You get about 25% in the smaller uh, training set. And then we're saying, if you add more data further and further back in time, you still get improvement in classification accuracy. And what this is showing is that the, st the signals are so stable that I could train a model on data that was recorded over a year ago and find that this actually still helps um, decoding on the new data that was just recorded. And so this is actually kind of a big deal for um, practical you know, clinical applications because if the signals aren't stable, then it, it can be really hard to enable good performance on complicated tasks. And it can be frustrating for a user if all of a sudden they're their system doesn't really work as well over time. It starts, the performance starts deteriorating. So this is a pretty 
uh, promising result for the technology for the approach that we use. Okay, so to summarize, um, we were able to observe very stable speech representations in the cortex of a person with severe paralysis, and we can use these to decode what they're trying to say in real time. Okay, um, in the final portion of the talk, I'm just going to talk about some next steps that we're working on to try to improve, improve the system. Um, one of these is a new feature set that we're using. So previously I, I, I briefly mentioned this high gamma activity range, which is commonly associated with speech processing. And that's what we use in this first study I just talked about. But there's evidence that other um, spectral information, so other components of the signal basically, can also be useful. So in this, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about how we analyzed this performance um, using these alternative feature set. And then in addition, in the previous work, we had Rava1 attempt, to, which is the, yeah, the participant, he tried to say these words aloud. And it's, it's quite effortful for him to do that. And it's also, you know, there's plenty of patients who can't produce any vocalizations. So we want to understand, okay, could our system work if he actually wasn't producing any sound when he's trying to speak, if he's just silently trying to speak? Because in that setup, that would be even more promising for the future of the technology because it indicates that it's perhaps more generalizable um, to, other, to other users who aren't able to make any sounds. So those are kind of the two things. We're looking at an alternative feature set, this low frequency signals, and then we're looking at silent speech attempts. And so what we're using to evaluate this is the NATO phonetic alphabet, because you know this is we found this to be a um, pretty justifiable uh, set of speech targets because they were kind of designed to be very distinct. And so we thought it would be a really good um, proof of concept to see, okay, if our uh, participant is trying to silently say these words, then can we decode these words using these features? And so the first thing I want to show on slide 29 is that you do see evoked activity during silent speech attempts. Sometimes it's similar to his overt speech, which is in green. This is um, him trying to speak aloud. And sometimes it's a little bit different. So what's actually being shown is some neural activity for uh, certain electrodes across many of his attempts to say each of these words either aloud or silently. Um, and then if we were to, you know, take all of this, all of his attempts to say these 26 kind of code words and then run a, a neural classifier on them, similar to the classification model I previously described. On the next slide, slide 30, you see that you do get um, highly discriminable uh, predictions, um, or I should say like fairly accurate predictions is what I mean. And I think the average accuracy was about 60% here. And so what this means is that even though he's silently speaking, we still are able to discern what he's trying, which word he's trying to say with you know, uh, fairly reliable accuracy. Um, and then to understand more about the new features we're using on the next slide, we actually see that these are working very well for us during silent speech. So this is on slide 31. We're showing that classification accuracy for these low frequency signals, which is the new signal in blue, abbreviated LFS, it's actually around 50% accuracy. And the signals we were, the features we were previously using was only about 35%. And so this is a little bit of an unexpected finding for us, um, I think there's a lot more investigation we need to do to fully understand this. And if this is you know, purely about his silent speech or if it's just something unique to him. Um, but the good news is that when you combine both features together and you use both at the same time, this is what's giving us the 60% accuracy. Okay, and then in the next slide, 32, we're seeing here that you may remember on the left, um, those electrodes on the bottom right were also 
uh, fairly active during overt speech in that plot I showed earlier in the talk. And we're still seeing that these are useful for the model here, um, even during silent speech. And then when you look at low frequency signals, you get a much wider distribution of electrodes that you know, contain useful information in this frequency range. And so this is also kind of an interesting finding. Um, it's more distributed throughout the kind of speech area, this VSMC. Um, so it is, again, pretty promising that we're able to get access to a relatively large portion of the brain surface so that, because um, as you can see, a lot of these electrodes are providing useful information for the models. Okay, and so the goal is to, you know, take this a next step and be able to actually decode speech from, um, decode silently attempted speech in real time to enable, uh, you know, communication similar to what we were previously demonstrated in that and that other work. So that's something that to look forward to in the future. Um, but just briefly talk about kind of three areas of the main next steps. Uh, we want to further improve the hardware. We think that with increased channel count, there's a lot of evidence to say that if we had even more channels to get an even finer resolution sampling of his cortical surface, that performance might go up even more. Um, there's some recent publications to suggest this as well uh, from separate research groups. Um, we definitely need to validate the approach in more than just one participant. So you know, we're recruiting more clinical trial participants to, to make sure that this works beyond just Bravo 1. And then lastly, we want to um, really expand beyond these kind of limited word decoding sets into something that can have a much larger vocabulary size um, so that it's something that they can use in their daily lives. Okay, and just to conclude, um, we think that these speech neuroprosthetic technology really has the potential and the promise to um, improve the quality of life of patients with paralysis, locked in syndrome by increasing their ability to communicate um, we show that in a proof of concept, a person with paralysis was able to use a, a simple form of a communication BCI using attempts to speak. And although there's still kind of a long way to go, we're already finding, you know, new feature sets and new um, control modalities that can really uh, bring this closer to fruition, closer to a practical and clinical application. Okay, and then just to give thanks to, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to everyone in the lab and then of course, Bravo One and his caregivers for being extremely helpful and supportive. Um, also a shout out to Dr. Edward Chang, the principal investigator who is you know supervising everything. And then also two graduate students on the team who are instrumental to, to all this work. It's Sean Metzger and Jesse Leo and then various others have contributed on the team and, and our funding sources. So yeah, thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for, sorry, my microphone <laughs> mute button was working for a sec. Um, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And this is, this is such impressive work, um, especially um, the the last um, few. Like everything is very impressive, but additionally to hear about your latest research uh, with the low frequency signals is is really so impressive. So, for, thank you for this wonderful talk and um, yeah for the work that you're doing. Um, I hope this will you know, be uh, implementable for a lot of uh, people with this, um, with this problem. So um, I want to open up, um, I want to give people a chance um, to speak. Yes, Serena, please go ahead. Excellent talk, a really fascinating. Um, and it uh, really hits on some, some key areas of interest. 
Um, I noticed um, early on, yeah, you chose the high gamma region and the particular frequency range, 70 hertz up to 150. And I was going to ask you early about that, but then you, when we get further into the talk, you go to the lower frequencies and, you know, have these, have this dramatic improvement in results. Um, and just to play my cards early, this is going to lead to questions about astrocytes. But the, uh, what's, what's interesting about that is that, you know, the astrocytes will form uh, these, uh, through calcium waves, these uh, larger uh, waves that will modulate neuron activity. Uh, but they're initially induced by it. And they can be responsible for waves in the theta region to low gamma, which was, you know, partly covered in, in your lower frequency range. What's so fascinating by the improvement saw is that uh, some of the recent advances I I indicates that it, it might be capturing more um, uh, uh, intent, I'll say, in this case. And so I'm curious in terms of model improvement, if the, um, if the models would take into account the coupling of the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies together in the sense that, say for an example, um, you know, the classic um, ice cream or ice cream, you know, very similar, um, you know, pronunciations, but very different intent. And it would be really interesting to see in cases where there's similar vocalization, but um, very different meaning to the subject, if those were better captured in the lower frequencies and the coupling of those lower frequencies to the higher frequencies, would that give better uh, discrimination? Any thoughts? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't have any intuition about if those kinds of uh, scenarios where the phonetically to, you know, they're phonetically ambiguous, but semantically unambiguous kind of in this, the ice cream situation. I don't, I don't know if that would be more easily identifiable in which frequency ranges, but I can say that this coupling, um, there's a common one that's kind of like phase amplitude coupling, which it's, it may sound uh, complicated, but all it means is that basically the the portion of the of the oscillation in the low frequency. So this kind of phase component of the low frequency is often coupled to the amplitude of the high frequency signal. And so these are alternative features that might, you know, it might be good to model them explicitly. Um, we still have kind of a lot of work to do to characterize and to do even more feature exploration um, because I think to us even seeing so much improvement um, was a little bit surprising and yeah I'm not sure you said you were going to ask about astrocytes I will have to say I don't I'm not an expert in in that or how that could affect what we've seen um, and how that could affect what we are seeing in these frequencies. But yeah, I just think well, in general, it, it's like, yeah, there's a lot more for us to look at for sure. It would precisely come through as a phase amplitude coupling because the, the waves in, you know, just even looking at the patterns, you'd see the waves there have a larger spread over the electrodes in the activity patterns. Um, it's during those, uh, those peaks, uh, there's potential or, uh, you know, potentiation or, you know, modulation of neural activity in the, in the region or what it's coupled to. And so you would see these interplays uh, and these couplings through, through a phase amplitude effect if, if the astrocytes were involved, one would, one would predict, or I, I certainly would. Um, so that, that is an interesting indication of a, a place for model improvement, but it's that's really fascinating. I, you know, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, it's very. Th there's so many directions to go with this. Um, so really fascinating work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just <clears throat> say, Doctor, that was an amazing talk, and um, thank you very much for 
for uh, taking the time to talk us through these things. And also, that is incredible, just what you're doing in a humanitarian sense. Um, <laughs> just thank you for being out there and letting, letting me know that if I know anybody who gets affected by something like this, that someone is actually allowing these people to still communicate. I, I just, I, I can't overestimate how incredible I think that is. Um, and I'm sure you've made the lives of these people so much filled with hope, the fact that what you've worked on for this. So thank you so, so much for that. That being said, um, I also have a question as well. Um, and I was reading your paper a bit and I was wondering, um, you were saying you were using deep learning algorithms um, to form computational models. That was, an, I don't know very much about this kind of thing. So I was wondering, could you uh, explain more about that, please? Yeah, I'm happy to. And first, yeah, I really, really appreciate um, those kind words. It's, it's nice. There's a lot of times, you know, where you're kind of bogged down and in the thick of it and you don't, I think it's hard to lose sight of, yeah, the, the bigger picture. And um, it's really nice to hear uh, your appreciation. So thank you for that. Hopefully, I, I do want to deliver on the hope on any hope that we provide any patients with this condition. So um, yeah, thank you. And then as to your question, these are kind of like, um, this deep learning is, is a very active field of machine learning. I mean, there's, you can see it probably anywhere you've seen some kind of major breakthrough in anything basically, uh, technological, um, in terms of like, uh, artificial intelligence, it's likely being driven by deep learning. So these new language models that can, you know, you tell them a few lines of Shakespeare and then they can generate the rest. Um, these ones that can, I mean, even Siri and Alexa, you know, when they interpret your voice, they're probably using deep learning models. Um, Self-driving cars are probably using it. So a lot of the, like the deep fake, um, all, a lot of these advanced artificial intelligence applications are using this and all it, you know, it's a very, very rich field. Um, I can try to summarize kind of the, the spirit of it, which is basically that you have a lot of data and you want to be able to um, have, have a you know, computer software algorithm to make predictions based on the data. That's a common use of this. And so you, a lot of times these data are very complex as in our case, where it's like these neural signals and they're not completely, you know, perfect signal or like they don't just encode speech, right? They're encoding a bunch of other things that the brain is doing. And so we have to pull the speech signals out of this area. And so there's a lot of things going on and there's very subtle patterns in these signals that we wouldn't be able to identify with a naked eye probably um, for the most part. And so these models are really good at finding like very subtle patterns and especially like nonlinear patterns. So things that are not very straightforward um, by using this kind of multi-layer. So it's layers and layers of these processing units that are during training, they're having their weights tuned. It's almost in many ways, it resembles a brain network. That's why it's called a neural network. Um, just like how you have certain brain regions that analyze something and then pass it to the next brain region. I mean, you can think of your auditory pathway, you know, there's some, or your visual pathway, there's complicated inputs, your retina is getting all kinds of signals and it's being passed through multiple layers of neurons. And then eventually it gives rise to your perception of that thing. And in many ways, it's kind of like you're training a, a tiny brain, a very simple brain to do a certain task. And that's kind of the spirit behind deep learning. Thank you. And uh, that, that's actually um, quite helpful because uh, I did recognize like, the term, but I wasn't sure exactly how this was kind of working for you. And and what and, and just so it's clear in my head, what kind of computational models was it helping you make? Was was this is this a way of um having them think of like a word like fish and it's 
sensing it's recording the signal and then you're now recording that when this particular thing happens in the brain that they mean fish or something else am i thinking of something else yeah no i think you're pretty close uh, so he's not just thinking it he and these um he's uh, even when he's silently saying it it's still a volitional attempt to like say it maybe not aloud but um even silently so that that's kind of the distinction i'd like to make so but yeah he's basically trying to either aloud or silently say a word and he does that hundreds of times for many words and so we have all that data and the neural activity associated with every one of the times where he tried to say each word and then the model is um trying to learn a mapping between the neural activity and the word targets and then when it sees a new neural activity like when we're running this in real time with him um it, there's a the model sees a new window of neural activity it tries to say okay i'm going to try to uh, you know i'm going to process this and i need to understand i know it's one of these words that i was trained on so which one is it and how likely is it word a how likely is it word b etc and so it's using this mapping it learns during training to uh, to do that during that test time. This is incredibly interesting. And so is this like then, if I was to just close my mouth and not say anything, but I'm thinking, hello, doctor, hello, doctor, like, you know, I, whatever happens, the fact that it can't go to, it's not going to my mouth. That's what you're looking at, isn't it? Like the, the actual willful thought of language it's just that for the people that can't uh that the process stops there and can't go through to their 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 voice or their muscles or wh whatever's wrong with them specifically yeah well actually yeah this is a it's a good question it's probably one i should have emphasized more in the talk um the signals we actually think we're tapping into are what we believe uh articular uh articulatory representations so i guess in answer to your question, it would be, no, I don't think we're getting just the semantic thought of like a doctor, for example. It's more that um, the brain signals that would have normally been sent to the vocal tract to tell the vocal tract to produce the word doctor aloud, those are the signals that we think we are recording from. And that's how we think our models are working. And this is based off prior research as well. Um, with other uh, research participants. So semantics, there, there is a lot of, there's some interesting research about semantic encoding in the brain, um, but I can say it's usually like very distributed. And so for a long-term implant, it would be really hard to get, what I mean by distributed, I mean, it's like, it's kind of all over the brain. And so for a long-term implant, it'd be really hard to get coverage of all those areas. So a lot of these MRI studies functional MRI studies have looked at semantics because they can kind of get signals from the whole brain. But yeah, so in short, it's, I think it's the articulatory representations that we're actually picking up on um, and not the, like the meaning behind the word. So you would have to try to say these things. You couldn't just think them. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Doctor. That's incredible. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, David. Um, thanks for the presentation. This was this is really amazing, and I've been kind of following up this, um, you know, BCI systems using ECOG, which I think has like more promising effects than sort of like a an implant approach. Even though like they both have merits. In fact, like my first question would be that, like, if you actually uh, compared, um, sort of like using the ECOG. And, and sort of like an implanted approach it may not be from your lab, but on the efficacy of like um, of discriminating between different words. And if you uh, actually try to compare that with, with what your, you know, with your results, and I guess like I'll start with that one. Um, I guess I, I may have, I may have uh, missed your question. You're asking if we compare this kind of the implant signals that we get from implants like the one we're using in the study. And what are you asking if uh, we can compare those two? So I was under the impression that this is actually an ECOGS signal that you're 
uh, anal analyzing. Is that, is that correct? Yes. That's, sure. So for those who don't know, that's uh, electrocorticography. It's, um, it's similar to an EEG, but it's on the surface of the brain. So it has to be implanted. But yes, that's right. So by implant, I mean something like, um, uh, you know, the Utah array or something that actually looks into units as opposed to like, um, um, you know, the different oscillations and different frequency bands. So I just wanted to know, like, if you actually compare those two and what are the merits and demerits of those, um, you know, using your approach, which basically measures ECOG as opposed to like measuring units and uh, basing the BCI um, uh, based off the, that measurement. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we have not looked at that. Um, we have not used Utah arrays. In, in our group to look at this. Uh, there are other groups who have, and they do find that they can decode some speech. Um, I think they've, it's only been tried in able speakers to my knowledge, um, this single unit approach. But in brief, the trade-offs is that um, you get less spatial coverage. So you have higher spatial resolution. You get a lot of electrodes and a small brain area and you're able to pick up single units and stuff. And that can be very interesting. Um, and I'm very interested in learning more and seeing more from other groups and things like that about what kinds of representations you can record with those technologies. With ECOG, you get a broader spatial coverage. Um, and so because we've seen that speech is kind of distributed across this VSMC area that I was showing, it seems likely that it's beneficial to have that broad coverage. Um, and then also the longevity of ECOG, like the stability is something that we're interested in because people have found that you can use Utah rates for a long time as well. So I'm not trying to say that they're unstable, but um, yeah, we think that because it doesn't have to actually penetrate the brain, it might be likely that, uh, it could just be more viable for a long-term interface, but uh, it's it's also possible that both could be viable. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes um, sense. I'm just curious, though, like, uh, I, I don't think it's possible to pick up LFBs using ECOG. Is it? Is it um, I may be wrong here. I think LFPs, well, LFP stands for local field potential. I think a lot of what we think we are recording are LFPs. Um, I don't think we can't get single unit, uh, like we can't, you know, identify individual neurons from ECOG, but yeah, I think a lot of what we think we are picking up on is, is these LFPs and this kind of general signal that's like across many neurons contributing to each electrode. Gotcha. Uh, and also, like, I guess this will be my last one because, like, uh, I see other people flashing their mic. So you used, um, uh, I guess, like, recurring neural, neural network kind of approach to essentially um, decode and predict the word um, based on the input. I'm just, I'm just curious, like, is it possible to create a, um, a feature space pretty much similar to, like, a, a word embedding space for the for the ECOG data. So basically you have like all those um, different uh, sets of inputs from each electrode. And based on that, I think, it, is it possible to have like an embedding matrix? Uh, and based on that, that you can actually make discrimination much easier. I think that, that would be far more simpler to do um, if, if it were like to be, if it were to be implemented on, on the local device as opposed to like porting it to a computer and making prediction afterwards. But is that something that you think you would look into? Interesting. So just to make sure I understand, your, are you suggesting something that could work across participants or, because, well, let me just say that currently the network does take in all inputs. And I think because that they're deep networks, they are able to kind of learn this, some kind of intermediate representation, which maybe you would consider an, an embedding, but um, you're suggesting that maybe there's an explicit embedding that maybe, um, yeah, I'm not, 
I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking about like using the electro data and um, essentially use that as a, as a means for for embedding. So when you're doing one word embedding, right? So you're doing um, an on a high dimensional feature space. You're just comparing um, words that that may be diametrically opposed, but they are actually closer in the dimension space. So basically, if you have like a man and a woman, basically these are, you know persons right so um the distance between those is actually a minimal compared to like a man and an orange something like that oh Does you're that saying sense? embedding in the speech space such as like word to vec or something like that exactly so doing oh, word to vec yeah. but for a neuron for for your uh ecop data that's it's interesting um it would probably be, this sounds like it would be some kind of dimensionality reduction, which I think we have tried. Um, but I think uh, in kind of the latest, our latest approach is we are, well, let me think. Yeah, I think that we did try this, but we found that the models with enough data that were capable of um, kind of doing its own, again, like intermediate representations. But maybe it is something that is worth revisiting. That's kind of interesting. If there's some kind of, is that a correct intuition that it's it's kind of like doing some form of dimensionality reduction because there's not really like when the word to vec embedding like speech embeddings you can use semantic information to do the embeddings. But here I'm not sure what you would use. You would perhaps use like spatial locations of the actual electrodes to do some kind of embedding. Um, but otherwise, it might just be little, like, kind of unsupervised dimensionality reduction. Yeah, I was thinking about, like, spatial dimension and how, um, like, based on, like, the, the, the time lag that you pick up different LFPs from different electrodes based on the position of every electrode, that can be probably be used as uh, uh, sort of like an embedding uh, feature, if you will. It's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'll have to think about that more. But yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, thank you. So I want to say thank you so much, David, for sharing such a wonderful study with us. So I want to ask you a question, I mean, more clinically relevant, because you chose, I mean, LIS patient. And um, I could not get it from your slide that which subtype exactly we are talking about. Are they the classical model partially or total? And uh, also, as we know that from the patient in the clinical level, uh, they are not experiencing the, um, you know, kind of stabilizing symptoms. Sometimes, for example, the gaze can change, the level of the gaze can change and they can start struggling with different symptoms gradually. Also, one of the symptoms is loss of the memory. I was just wondering how your device gonna work on those patients. Yeah, um, I think for maybe I didn't uh, say this in the slides. Um, apologies if so, but our the patient that we've tested this with is not locked in. Um, technically, he's diagnosed as having an arthria and severe spastic quadriparesis. And so what this means is he has very, very minute um, limb and yeah, limb movements. So he uh, not enough to walk or type or to, you know, pick up an object, but he can move slightly. Um, so he's able to control his wheelchair sometimes um, using a like a, his electronic wheelchair using a joystick and kind of like pressing his arm against it. And then he can also, again, produce some vocalizations, um, even though they're highly unintelligible. So he's technically not locked in. Um, and because he had a brainstem stroke and he doesn't have something like ALS, uh, his, his condition is actually fairly stable. Um, we haven't seen any cognitive decline whatsoever. Um, he's actually, yeah, he's an incredible person. He's 
he taught himself English completely after his disability. Um, he didn't. He never spoke English in his life, basically, and was able to learn it. And even has done some part-time work as a web developer, you know, using his painstaking, um, his painstaking like assistive communication technology. So he still, yeah, we're not. We don't have to thankfully worry about his cognitive decline. Um, we check regularly, of course, but we don't anticipate any uh, degradation there. If that is something that happens in future patients, like in a future application, um, that is a really good question. We hope that, I mean, right now, if this technology were to work, it wouldn't be able to restore someone's memory or to enhance cognitive functions directly in, you know, in that type of way. But we just, our hope and our assumption is that if they are still cognitively intact enough to be able to try to speak. And when they try to say a word, they're doing it accurately. Um, then the technology could still work for them. Oh, I see that you have a plan ahead. You have a long way to go, I mean, for get more samples, this different situation, probably. But uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, definitely a lot of work left to do for sure. Quick question, how do you check for cognitive decline? Yeah, so we have a we have a really kind of simple survey that we ask every time we work with them, every session. Um, these are kind of just basic questions about the surroundings. And then every month we have a more thorough exam to yeah, just make sure we understand his cognitive state. But he is a you know, during a session two, he communicates with us using this like assistive technology. It's controlled mostly by, he has uh, residual neck motion. So he can kind of control a little bit um, technology that uses, that relies on that. And so he can use that to communicate. So one example is like a laser pointer attached to like a cap or his glasses or something like that. And then that can be used to indicate letters that he, on a on a let, a physical letter board, um, and so yeah, he's he's often communicating with us and and expressive, you know, fairly expressive for someone in his state. So um, yeah, that's kind of all those things together is how we assess that. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Of course, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, the other speaker left uh, the stage, um, I think he had to. Uh, does anyone else have questions so far? Frank, do, do you want to ask a question before I go? Uh, yeah, sure. The, uh, thank you. The, uh, hi, David, uh, again as well. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation to our uh, uh, group. Uh, fascinating work. So uh, I do have a, a question of the uh, the data you presented uh, uh, on the slide number 21. I, I'm just uh, trying to get the whole, whole picture of, uh, uh, I'm still working on, you know, reading through the all the, getting the whole uh, structure of your experiment, experiments. But just on this particular slides that you show an uh, example of uh, decoded uh, sentences. And uh, I'm just curious just to, 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 to uh, and I wanna uh, uh, ask your clarification, the, uh, w why there was that uh, uh, false uh, red uh, uh, result of good in with language model. I mean that's uh, the so. I I'm also uh, curious what type of uh, I mean uh, could you uh, sh uh, shed light uh, more light on the the more specifics of that type of uh, the particular uh, choice of a language model out of many that a uh, uh, what what's your rationale of choosing that one uh, for your application? Yeah, certainly. Um, the language model we use here is actually fairly basic, to be honest. It's it's what known as the n-gram model, which is uh, used to be, there was a time when there was this was state-of-the-art kind of language modeling, maybe a, a decade or two ago. 
Um, but recently there's a lot of, again, like deep learning language models that, that kind of um, have taken over. But, you know, the goal of the paper was to, and because of the constrained vocabulary space, right, with just 50 words, we didn't think we needed a extremely sophisticated language model. So we used a pretty basic one here. Um, and with this particular error, I think, you know, these, these sentences were relatively hand selected, I would say, to kind of demonstrate the effect of the language model, and to also give the readers a sense of the types of sentences that um, the user was able to generate using our technology. Um, and so this error most likely happened because my family is good it is, I mean, that's a reasonable sentence, right? And so it, it kind of made this, um, it made this mistake here because you can, it's just to show that it's kind of a double-edged sword in some ways. Um, usually it's very beneficial, but there are instances where the language model might actually affect the outcome for, for the worse. So it's possible that the language model thought it was way more likely that someone would say, my family is good, as opposed to my family is here. And the neural model itself maybe was like, you could think of it like, here was the most likely, but good was really close to second place. And so the language model just flipped them when it when it was used. Um, perhaps with a yeah more sophisticated language model, this error could have been avoided. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's actually confirmed on my uh, guesses. Thank you. Yep, no problem. I had another question, um, and and to go back to the uh, the low frequency coupling in with the the higher frequencies. Um, in some cases, these uh, these astrocytes will induce neural activity, but in other cases, they shut it down. And I'm wondering if um, in your model, in the uh, or if it's at least accessible, to get correlations of when low frequencies amplitudes are high, uh, which high frequencies happen to go low versus also go high. Because uh, there may be some some key information there. Just wondering if your model is capturing that, or if it if it could be extended to to capture that. Um, I may have missed it a little bit. You're asking if they can, if the models are able to identify when the low frequency and high gamma move kind of with each other versus against each other. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We. We think that the models are able to um, discern this because for for this task or for that data, I should say, um, we have a fair amount of trials or so a fair amount of samples. And uh, we haven't tried like, you could imagine we could test this by also including a feature in which it's purely a measure of that. Like, is it currently positively correlated or negatively correlated across this small time window? Um, and maybe that could address this question of like, if we included that feature uh, explicitly, and then we saw an improvement in performance, then um, that would mean the model previously was not actually learning to that property. Um, so it's interesting. That might be a, a good follow-up for us to just test and just to make sure that it is able to identify something like this. Well, yeah, that would be, that would certainly be interesting if that was a positive result, because uh, I think it would further implicate the, um, you know, the nature of the coupling and uh, what might be behind it, and particularly the astrocyte waves activating regions, um, either positively or, or negatively correlated to their um, the wave amplitudes in the lower frequencies. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, we'll have to talk to one of my colleagues about that. Thanks for the suggestion. Well, thank, thank you. This is really fascinating work and it's really um, got me thinking. It's great stuff.
much appreciated. Yeah, it it has me thinking a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of consumes, uh, kind of consumes what I think about all the time, as you might imagine. It can. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, I wanted to ask if, um, and actually Jamie also kind of had this question. We had um, a previous guest speaker here talking about the BCR work to um, basically uh, read out um, visualizations in the brain of pictures people were actually seeing and then people were imagining and they could kind of dissect that out. Mm, do you think that this type of data set would be helpful to add on um, later on? Do you, do you think that would make an improvement or would that just be too much computing power necessary that would delay basically um, you know, the technique and not really helpful would just create more noise for this, you know, for this usage mainly. That's interesting. I wonder, yeah, I know some folks use something like that in, uh, I guess over in Jack Allen's lab at UC Berkeley. I don't know if that's where this, uh, who gave this talk, but what? yeah, generally speaking. Oh, sorry, it was in Japan. Oh, go ahead. Um, a Japanese. Um, I, oh, a Japanese. Okay. Yeah, I can forward you the, you know, the paper if you want to. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think that, unfortunately, I so I can think of a few ways where that might be helpful, but I don't think it could help with the main goal of like discriminating speech targets or um, kind of like directly improving communication, and that's for a few reasons. One. One is, um, well, actually, let me, let me take that. Yeah, the, the main one that I'm thinking of now is just spatial coverage. It's more of a practical limitation. And what I mean by that is I uh, am fairly confident. I'm, you know, I don't know for sure, but I'm fairly confident that the brain areas that were really useful um, for enabling this kind of decoding of, for example, imagined visual imagery are likely not the brain area that we can cover uh, with our implant. Um, or if we did, we would have to not cover the speech area, which, you know, it, it's hard to get both is what I'm saying. And if you did have both, then I could have actually imagined a situation where that would be helpful. You know, if someone is saying computer and then they're imagining a computer, perhaps, you could do both at the same time and then combine the outputs from both models. Um, that would be pretty interesting. I'm just worried that, you know, these brain areas are, are not close to each other that are typically um, most implicated in, you know, speech versus vision. They're quite far. So, I mean, but that, I mean, that would be a really interesting, you know, analysis if, if someone is able to reward from both at the same time and to see, you know, how, how far you can push a system of that nature. Yeah, yeah, that's why I asked the question, because I thought maybe sometimes, you know, just, you know, if you imagine, if you have the image of um, specific landscape, it probably takes longer to, like, because they were they were describing landscapes, and um, and they could like display the image of the um, of the landscape basically um, after a lot of training. But um, like maybe it could speed up the process of communication if sometimes you can just um, you know translate the imagery instead of you know fully describing it, but. Yeah, I I have to look up exactly which main regions they, because I can't remember right now. Um, but yeah, that's so so having two implants would probably be too much. 
um, would probably be also risky or, you know, too much data, maybe. Well, not necessarily. There are other projects with, um, I think I've seen up to, definitely up to three, like, connectors, brain connectors, which means, up, you know, at least three implants uh, with kind of these, like, we had this one metal feed through that's implanted in our participants, you know, skull, basically, that we used to connect and to read the signals out from the uh, electrodes. And there are people right now who have up to three of those. Um, with They don't use the ECOG, the, the same type of array that we do, but um, yeah, so it's not impossible. I think that probably if you were able to really clearly justify that, then, you know, FDA might give approval for a trial like that. Um, I don't know how much more research would be needed. I don't, I'm not super plugged into the visual decoding uh, literature, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not impossible. Definitely not impossible. Interesting. Thank you. And um, do, do you think it will be not a difficult task to do this in different languages um, or should it be pretty much, you know, um, a pretty straightforward approach to do this for other languages? Yeah, that is something that we're interested in. Um, I, our hypothesis is that this should be doable in, in any vocal language. If, as long as the, you know, speech targets are distinguishable, because this goes back, this ties back to something that I said earlier, which is that um, we think we're tapping into the ar articulatory representations into kind of the vocal tract commands. And so if a language is spoken, of course, sign language would be different, but if a spoken language, you know, relies on different articulators, then it's probably in this brain region where those articulators are, you know, being coordinated. And so, yeah, we think it is likely that this could work in other languages. Honestly, one of the biggest um, kind of technical challenges right now is that the you know language models in English are very good because a lot of the researchers are working in English. Um, and so it's a little bit more difficult to get um, reliable language models in other languages, but it's certainly not impossible either. Yeah, those do exist. So um, yeah, in short, we do think it, the technology could be applied in, in other languages for sure. Yeah, thank you so much um, for answering those questions. Um, I want to give other people also opportunity to ask again. Do you have more questions? Anyone? Uh, Abyss, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Um, yeah, so, David, I had also the pleasure of talking with somebody who's also doing um, this kind of work, except that they're actually, they actually did this with a patient with well, a patient with ALS and um, they had um, some success um, targeting M1 I think um, uh, because like it was they were kind of racing against time um, because like uh, the the conditions were kind of like a, a, you know sort of turning for the worst but so I guess my question is like uh, do you um, does your method actually also provide some kind of flexibility addressing um, highly active uh, cortices in the brain as opposed to like uh, um, the areas that you targeted using um, your ECOG for better prediction or at least like translating this to patients to, that have um, sort of like neurodegenerative disease like LS? Yeah, I mean, I would be interested in hearing more about um about this other this other line of work with this other participant, I assume it maybe it wasn't speech if it was an M one, but um, it is that is interesting. It's unfortunate to hear about the deterioration um, 
we do think that as long as the cortex, the speech cortex is, you know, not, uh, those neurons aren't dying or atrophying or, or um, you know, that area is not deteriorating, then we suspect that this, our approach would, you know, be stable, even if there was a lot of other neurodegeneration. If there was neurodegeneration in the speech area that we were targeting, um, yeah, that becomes, I think it's just totally unclear what would happen in that case. I can't assume that, you know, performance wouldn't be negatively affected if there was a large amount of deterioration. I, I didn't, I don't know if that answered your question about trying to target a different brain area. Um, if it didn't, let me know. Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, like, uh, uh, you, you're only working with a uh, single patient with, with like, very particular pathology. Um, luckily, this, the patient that you work with has no kind of regressive kind of um, neural activity in their cortex, except that they're quadriplegic, um, if I understand it correctly. So I just wanted to intimate your, your work with um, others doing, trying to do the same thing, but they're, like, targeting M1 because of, you know this um you know the the nature the progressive nature of the uh you know the als at the time so i just wanted to mention that and how if if your work can actually be translated to doing uh speech detection and speech recognition and people that have sort of degenerative um disease um like motor related degenerative disease like how would you be able to translate that that's what i, I wanted to know but you gave me the answer for that um thank you Got it, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. So um, I wanted to ask, so um, I know you gave us like um, the current updates. Um, so how long do you think it will take to um, to like um, so check, um, you know, to to um, apply this for more patients. And do you think that then for um, in the future, how, how long do you think, since you have already data sets, do you think you can, you will be able to use it to um, have a faster, basically, training time for um, for future patients? Or do you think that um, you cannot really use the um, like the data sets from one patient to the other to like pre-train and have like a fast um, Im implementation of this technology? So, yeah, that's a good question. I think there is promise for uh, being able to use pre-trained models. Um, this is a in kind of machine learning, it's, it's a concept that's often referred to as transfer learning, where you kind of transfer information learned from one task or from one data set to improve modeling on a different data set. And so the good news is that this is something that we've already, we've actually already shown is doable in um, epilepsy patients. So in the in the historical patients that we used to, uh, that I used to work with, people in the lab still do work with actively, these epilepsy patients who come in for a seizure localization, and while they're there, they do these participate in these speech studies. And this is where a lot of the foundation for techniques and theories that we use in this clinical trial came from, um, and not just in our lab, in other labs too. But so basically, we had. Uh, one in one of these studies from uh, Joseph Macon, published in 2020, they showed that um, you could take. So let's say you trained a deep model on patient A, you could actually freeze temporarily a lot of the uh, the layers that are deeper in to the model that are getting closer to the output. So you're going from brain activity to text, and the parts of the, the layers that are close to the text portion, you say, okay, these are probably good, but now I'm gonna transfer it to patient B and I'm just going to have a new input layer. 
because this is the layers that are going from neural activity to some intermediate representation. And so you train that on the new, for the new mapping, and then you can kind of train the whole model a little bit further. And you find that this actually is better than just starting from scratch. So the takeaway here is that there's some benefit of, you know, trying to have a, a shared intermediate feature space that is shared across multiple participants. Um, but because the brains, everyone's brain is a little different, the arrays, the electrodes might be in a different place. So you need the input layer to be kind of new for each person. But yeah, so hopefully, and it's not just the models too and the data that we already have, it's like the techniques and the, um, the analyses are, you know, we spent a lot of time getting those up and running. And so I'm hoping that when we get more participants, we can move even more quickly and just focus on um, kind of reevaluating things and, and understanding how generalizable our approach is. May I ask um, two more questions of you, Doctor? Um, actually, I was just thinking about it as I was listening to you talk. Um, one of them was, do you think what you're currently working on is the kind of thing that um, would have maybe helped people like in similar situations, like say Stephen Hawking? Because I remember um, he, I think, I can't remember if he twitched a finger or if he used his eye, but um, that I think he had to go through letter by letter to put things down like that, and I'm wondering if this kind of procedure could have actually um, allowed, obviously it wasn't around then, but uh, could have allowed him or people like himself to actually have much more um, direct, faster communication with people. That was the first question. Um, and this, oh, actually, I'll, I'll let you yeah, answer that one before I ask my second one. Sure thing, yeah. I mean, man, what an honor it would have been to have Stephen Hawking as a as a clinical trial participant. Um, yeah, he did have ALS and I think that he would pre-program his, like his responses and his outputs. And then he could use a, a minute finger movement, I think to, to play those if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, but his condition was fairly stable, all things considered, you know, relative to many other progressions of the disease. And so um, I think it is possible I think it's possible that it could have worked. You know, I know nothing about his exact neuropathology. I know nothing about if his speech motor cortex was intact, but he was certainly cognitively intact. Um, so I would assume that if, you know, the speech area of his brain was also intact and if he was physically able to, to participate, um, then maybe, yeah, we, we could have, he would have been a, an amazing, incredible uh, clinical trial participant. See, this is the kind of thing that excites me with uh, the future because there could very well be the next Stephen Hawking who has a uh, locked in syndrome or something similar. And because of what you're working on, they will be able to express themselves to the world. And secondly, second question, what is your ultimate goal like like if you were to sit down and think of like the the ultimate dream of, of this particular project would it be to have like a like a speech box beside all the people with um everything from uh, from difficulty moving with als right up to locked in syndrome have a box that could allow them to go hi honey what's for dinner tonight or how are you today um, and actually communicate like like that like um like like freely is that the ultimate goal or is it something further or what, what would your vision be yeah i mean i think that that is that is kind of what you describe it would be um i mean obviously if it was non-invasive that would be super ideal because then the person wouldn't need surgery to get our our neural device but we're okay with having that be in the kind of uh more or less ideal um system which would be there would be some implant that would send signals, you know, fully implantable, send signals to uh, either a phone or uh, some small box or a personal device or something, you know, very unobtrusive for, for the user. And then with that, they would just naturally try to speak 
and say whatever they want. And, you know, ideally it would be even be in their voice, right? We want it to be, you know, speech is very expressive. And right now we, you know, we're, we're working towards, um, we're just trying to build the building blocks, right? But it would be awesome in the future if it could be very expressive speech in the person's voice that's, you know, being generated as they're trying to say it so that you wouldn't, it would be very rapid and conversational. It would be a natural, you know, natural dialogue between um, anyone the user is speaking with and just completely open vocabulary. I mean, this is all, you know, I would say very optimistic, um, but that would be, yeah, that would be a really great goal to, that's a great goal that we strive for is, you know, basically a full restoration of speech through this kind of uh, technological intermediate. That is actually a wonderful uh, goal. I'm going to hope for the same thing myself. And uh, if we can't rely on you scientists to be dreamers, then uh, we're truly lost, eh? So thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Jamie. appreciate that. Yeah, um, we've been going for over an hour and a half, so we took up a lot of your time. So um, thank you so much for coming. I just, um, um, yeah, it's such fascinating work and also additionally such wonderful goals for for us, for us humans. And um, I wish you all the best for the future, all the grants and, um, you know, the least hurdles that <laughs> you can get. And uh, we all cheer you on and feel always welcome in this club and to come back and share or maybe um, come and listen to, um, to presentations. And so it was a great honor to have you here and uh, yeah. Uh, have always in mind that you know we <laughs> we are very fascinated by your work and we we support it and um, yeah it's amazing what you do so thank you you here you here and and we'll also if we get any other speakers in the future that we think would um, help your work along we'll be sure to tell them about you and see if we can put you together because we've had such an incredible variety of speakers so far and more and more yet to come thank you doctor. Thank you. I really, really appreciate all these kind words. Um, yeah, it was definitely my pleasure speaking here and interacting with all of you. So all the best wishes to you as well. Uh, thank you so much, David. We can't wait to have you back and hear what happens next in your work. Okay, yeah, this will be my pleasure then as well. Great. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming and asking questions and engaging in the discussion. Um, we really appreciate um, everyone that um, comes here to our club and is interested. And um, if you like the discussion and it was the first time you came, um, join the Science Society Club and um, you can um, for, uh, check out what's um, happening next. So uh, tomorrow we will have um, uh, from the UK, so it's earlier in the day. Um, at 2 p.m. EST, Dr. Lepore, um, he will be talking about artificial 3D printed robot skin that feels more like um, that is able to have sensory information input um, that is kind of human-like. So um, this will be also interesting for the future. And then um, uh, we will have here Dr. Hans um, talking about um, his uh, model and solution for decentralized urban energy storage, which is important for renewable energy um, energies in the future. We need, um, since there's a big fluctuation in renewable energies when they come, when the inputs basically is generated, so need to have, you know, big storage facilities. And he has a really interesting uh, urban approach to use uh, huge buildings for um, 
use them as batteries. So uh, yeah, it will be really interesting to learn about it. And yeah, thank you again, David. Um, and um, I hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful rest of your evening and everyone else around the world. Good morning to you or uh, whatever time zone you're in. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me again. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Yeah.